Unit 5, Solutions, Lecture 1. We've been talking about reactions. Now we're going to talk about reactions that occur in solution, usually in aqueous solution. Then we're going to expand our discussion of solutions and talk about concentration, stoichiometry in solutions, things of this type. You are probably very familiar with these terms we list as key terms, but let's review them anyway. Solution. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. When we think of solutions, we usually think of it as a solid dissolved in a liquid, but that certainly is not necessarily the case. Solute is the substance that is being dissolved, and the solvent is the dissolving medium. The solvent with which you're most likely familiar is water, but there are many other solvents. Insoluble means the material appears to be virtually incapable of dissolving. Now, often it occurs that minute amounts of this material may actually dissolve, as we will see when we do the mathematics, but it appears to be virtually incapable of dissolving. Unsaturated? Unsaturated tells us that more solute can be dissolved in that particular amount of solvent at that temperature. A saturated solution is the one that is thought to contain the maximum mass of solute for that amount of solvent normally possible at that temperature. Theoretically, you can't dissolve any more at that temperature. Supersaturated, however, tells us that more solute is dissolved in that particular volume of solvent than is normally possible at that temperature. And the operative term here is normally possible. Supersaturated solutions are an interesting phenomenon, and we'll have to talk about them later when we talk about what holds things together in a solution. Why do some things dissolve and others not dissolve? For example, consider sodium chloride in water. Now we know that sodium chloride will dissolve in water, at least to some pretty good extent. But there are other things that won't dissolve in water. And why is that? Well, it has to do with attractions. It has to do with whether the solute molecules or ions, as in this case, are more attracted to the water molecules, or whatever the solvent may be, than they are to each other. If they're more attracted to the water molecules than they are to each other, then they're going to wind up bonding to the water molecules, for example. And there's also another factor. Water molecules can come in between the sodium ions and the chloride ions, for example, and shield them from each other. It's not a really simple process, and it is something that we will talk more about as the course goes on. More key terms are electrolytes. Electrolytes are substances that will conduct an electrical current in solution or when, when, or when mobile. For example, it could be molten, it could be made liquid and conduct an electrical current, when in the solid state it would not conduct an electrical current current. But in any case, we generally think of electrolytes as substances that conduct an electrical current when dissolved. But you do need to know that this can occur to varying degrees. Some things can really dissolve a bunch, produce a lot of electrical current in solution. Other things, not so much. And non-electrolytes? Well, non-electrolytes are substances that will not conduct an electrical current in solution. Substances that are just not going to, to conduct an electrical current, even though they may be dissolved. Strong electrolytes. Strong electrolytes dissociate virtually 100% in solution. They separate into their ionic parts, their ions in solution. And these ions then, moving around in the solution, will conduct a current strongly. On the other hand, there are weak electrolytes, which dissociate only partly or partially, usually, usually to a very small extent, sometimes 
less than 5%. They do this to a small extent when in solution. Therefore, they don't produce very many ions in solution, hence conduct a current weakly. And then there are non-electrolytes, which are substances that do not tend to dissociate in solution. They may be soluble in water, for example, but they don't tend to dissociate in water and form ions in water. Therefore, they will not conduct an electrical current to a significant extent when in solution. What are strong electrolytes? They are strong acids, strong bases, and soluble salts. Let's take each one separately. Let's begin with the strong acids. Now this is the list of acids that you need to memorize. The strong acids are hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid. But now look at sulfuric acid. It has two hydrogens there. It is a strong acid only through the first dissociation or through the first ionization, whichever way you wish to say it. The other part is weak, but we'll talk about that when we get there. And perchloric acid. There are some other strong acids, but we're not likely to run into them. So we will say that all other acids are considered weak, unless otherwise indicated. When we write these strong acids in solution, we should write them the way they appear predominantly, in this case, as ions. Therefore, instead of writing HCl aqueous, or just HCl with the assumption that it's aqueous, write hydrogen ions and chloride ions. But actually, it's more correct to write them as hydronium ions and chloride ions, because the hydrogen ion bonds to the water molecule, producing the hydronium ion. Now, how would you write these? For example, HBr. If you are referring to HBr as the acid of strong acid, you should properly write it as either hydrogen ions and bromide ions or hydronium ions and bromide ions. Well, what about nitric acid? Is it a strong acid? Okay, then you should write it as hydrogen ions and nitrate ions or, that's right, hydronium ions and nitrate ions. What about nitrous acid? How would you write that? You would write it as nitrous acid. Why? It is not a strong acid. It is a weak acid. So you write it in the molecular form. Now when we look at strong bases, we find that most of our strong bases are the soluble hydroxides. They are the 1A hydroxide and some of the 2A hydroxides. Let's be specific. Lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, cesium hydroxide, and I dare say that if we could get our hands on some some francium hydroxide, it would be soluble also. In the 2A hydroxides, they're not as soluble. Calcium hydroxide is pretty soluble. Strontium hydroxide is, and so is barium hydroxide. The heavier hydroxides, you will notice, tend to be the ones that are soluble. The lighter 2A hydroxides are not. Now what about things like aluminum hydroxide and zinc hydroxide and so forth. Well, quite frankly, most hydroxides simply won't dissolve. So if you look at this list that you have here and commit that to memory, you will have a pretty good handle on what, what might be the strong bases. Some of those two hydroxide, 2A hydroxides are not quite as strong and may be termed moderate, but for our purposes, they are strong. When we write these strong bases in solution, we should write them as they appear predominantly, and that is as ions. In other words, instead of sodium hydroxide, we should write sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Instead of calcium hydroxide, write calcium ions and two hydroxide ions, because when the calcium hydroxide breaks up, 
it gives us one calcium ion and two hydroxide ions. But what about aluminum hydroxide? Well, it is written as aluminum hydroxide in what we would term the molecular form. And soluble salts? How should they be written? Well, soluble salts should be written as ions because that's what they break up into when they get into a medium that will permit them to have mobility. But which salts are soluble? Well, in order to determine this, we need to know the solubility rules. So here they are. All acetates, nitrates, chlorates, perchlorates, alkali metal compounds, and ammonium compounds are soluble. Just learn it. All chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble, except silver, mercurous, and plumbus chlorides, bromides, and iodides. Sulfates are soluble, except strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, mercurous sulfate, and plumbus sulfate are not soluble. Everything else, for our purposes, is not soluble. It's insoluble. Got it? Acetates, nitrates, chlorates, perchlorates, the alkali metal compounds, and ammonium compounds are soluble. The chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble, except silver chloride, mercurous chloride, and plumbus chloride, for example, are not soluble. Nor are the bromides or iodides. Sulfates are soluble, but strontium, barium, mercurous, and plumbus sulfates are not soluble. And all else, well, it's insoluble. Got it? How do you learn these best? Put them on flashcards. Carry them around with you. Say them again and again. Write them many times until you have it thoroughly ingrained in your brain. Now, which of these are soluble? What about sodium chloride? Mm -hmm. It is a, an alkali metal compound, so yes, it's soluble. What about mercurous bromide? Ah, what are the exceptions? That's right, mercurous bromide is not soluble. What about ferrous iodide or iron 2 iodide? Remember, all of the chlorides, bromides, iodides, and so forth are soluble? Yep, that's right. Ferrous iodide is soluble. What about ferric chloride? Same reason. Ferric chloride is soluble. What about what about what about lead to iodide or plumbus iodide? That's right, that's one of those exceptions. It is not soluble. And silver bromide? Another exception, it is not soluble. Okay, magnesium sulfate, what about it? That's right, it's soluble. And barium sulfate? Look at your second rule on the sulfates, and you know that it's not soluble. What about calcium acetate? Think about that first rule. All acetates nitrates, chlorates, bromates, perchlorates, yeah, I'll, mm -hmm, that's right, it's soluble. What about ammonium sulfate? Yes, that's another soluble one. What about sodium borate? That's right, it also is soluble. And what about zinc carbonate? Well, quite frankly, there are not a lot of the carbonates that are soluble. About the only ones that are soluble are the alkali metal carbonates and the ammonium carbonate. So that goes right along with that rule. Zinc carbonate is not soluble. Now, to date, we have studied combination reactions, decomposition reactions, and single replacement, which we call simple replacement. Now we're going to add metathetical reactions.
And not only are we going to add metathetical reactions, we're going to address the times that we should use the total and the net ionic equations. These reactions are often called double replacement reactions, and they have a particular form. They take this form, AB plus CD producing AD plus CB. In other words, positions A and C are swapped. A replaces C and C replaces A. At least one of the reactants must be mobile. And so you're going to find that these reactions frequently occur in a solution. Mobility is often required for reactions to occur. But why? Why is mobility necessary? I want you to pause for a moment and envision how the reaction between compounds AB and CD might occur. And then as we proceed through metathetical reactions, see if your model is supported or if you must modify your model. All right, let's go. Let's see how we would predict metathetical reactions. There are three cases. The first case that we use to predict metathetical reactions is a case in which a precipitate is formed. In other words, an insoluble material has been produced. A second case is water is formed in a process that we call neutralization. And the third case is a gas is formed and that gas is given off. Let's look at the first case in which a precipitate is formed. Now, this reaction is driven by the formation of something that precipitates out of solution. It's the formation of an insoluble material. And to predict these reactions, we need to know what will and will not dissolve in our solvent. In most cases, it's going to be water. So we need the solubility rules. Again, you do remember them, don't you? Uh-huh. Yeah, you're thinking about that. Consider this reaction. We take zinc sulfate and plumbus nitrate and put them in solution. Now, are we going to get a reaction? Well, how do you begin? What you do is you swap either the cations or the anions and then check out the solubilities of the products. So if we swap the zinc and the lead, we put the zinc with the nitrate and the lead with the sulfate, what do we see? Well, the zinc nitrate is soluble. Well, what about the plumbus sulfate? Remember, the plumbus sulfate is insoluble. So the equation then becomes, because the formation of that plumbus sulfate is driving the reaction, the equation then becomes zinc sulfate plus, plum plus plumbus nitrate gives you zinc nitrate and a precipitate of plumbus sulfate. Let's try these. Let's look at silver nitrate and sodium chloride. Now think about swapping the cations. Think about swapping the silver and the sodium. So if you put the silver with the chloride and the sodium with the nitrate, what will you get? And try this one. Now I will put these reactions up here and we will pause for a moment and you can shut down this system if you want to and try your hand at this and then I'm going to show you what will happen with each. Sodium carbonate and potassium iodide. Think about that. Sodium carbonate and nickel nitrate. Nickel 2 nitrate. Sodium sulfate and strontium nitrate. Sodium sulfate and barium chloride. Now, try your hand at these reactions. Pause this lesson, try your hand, and then when you're ready, start it up again, and I will show you what we get. On the first one, we're going to get silver chloride precipitating out, and that's going to leave us sodium nitrate in solution. 
On this next one, we get plumbus iodide precipitating out. And that leaves us potassium nitrate in solution because potassium nitrate is soluble. And on the next one, well, if you switch the sodium and the potassium, nothing happens. There's no reaction because sodium iodide and potassium carbonate are both soluble. What about this one? With sodium carbonate and nickel-2 nitrate, we get nickel-2 carbonate precipitating out, leaving us sodium nitrate in solution. And this one, we have strontium sulfate precipitating out, leaving us sodium nitrate in solution. And folks, it doesn't matter which you, which you write first. You can write the strontium sulfate, showing it as a precipitate, or you can write the sodium nitrate, knowing that it does not precipitate. Either one of those can be written first. It doesn't matter. And on this last one, we get sodium chloride and a precipitate of barium sulfate. Now, you will need to know your solubility tables in order to produce these reactions of this particular type in which an insoluble material is formed. You're the director of a lab, and as such, you have to make sure that you provide a broad variety of chemicals to your scientists to meet whatever needs they may happen to have with regard to their work. But one day, a scientist comes to you needing a solution of sodium nitrite, but you don't have any. What reaction would you instruct your tech to use in making this? Let's go to the second one. Water is formed in a process called neutralization. Now, this is the classic reaction in which an acid plus a base produces a salt and water. But I want us to address an issue first, and that is, what is a salt? Well, a salt is best defined or best described as the cation of a base with the anion of an acid. The cation of a base, the positive ion from a base and the negative ion from an acid. For example, if we take hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide and put them together. We take the cation of the base and the anion of the acid and put them together, we get the salt, sodium chloride, and we produce water. You get the idea. Now complete this one. We have potassium hydroxide and chloric acid. What do you produce? You produce potassium chlorate and water. Yeah, neutralization. What about calcium hydroxide and phosphoric acid? Put the calcium with the phosphate to form Ca3PO4 twice and water. No, I did not balance it. You can do that. Now remember, a salt can be defined by the acid and the base that could be used to produce it. That salt, calcium phosphate, can be defined by the calcium hydroxide and phosphoric acid that are used. For example, what would you use to produce PBI2? Well, you could take plumbus hydroxide and hydroiodic acid to produce plumbus iodide, and water. Along that line, what acid and base could you use to make sodium chloride? Well, you've seen that. That is sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. What about zinc sulfate? Well, there you can use zinc hydroxide and sulfuric acid. What about lithium bromide? You could use lithium hydroxide and hydrobromic acid. Are you getting the idea? Okay. I want you to consider the basic anhydride. Now, a basic anhydride behaves like a base, but what is a basic anhydride? The easiest way to describe a basic anhydride is to tell you to think of it as a base from which water was removed, a dried up base. 
For example, if the base is calcium hydroxide, look at that, take out H2O. The anhydride is calcium oxide. That's right, a metal oxide. A basic anhydride is a metal oxide. And if you take that metal oxide and put it in water, you rehydrate it, making calcium hydroxide. Since a basic anhydride is a metal oxide, and a metal oxide acts like a base, well, perhaps then a metal oxide plus an acid will also produce a salt in water. Well, let's look at one. There's calcium oxide and hydrochloric acid. And when they're allowed to react, sure enough, they produce the salt, calcium chloride, and water. Just not as much water as there would be if we used calcium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. And there we also produce calcium chloride, but look, it's a lot more water. What about magnesium oxide and sulfuric acid? Yep, produces magnesium sulfate and water. Well, what about aluminum oxide and oxalic acid. What do you think will happen there? And the answer is it will produce aluminum oxalate and water. Now I didn't balance these last two equations, but you can handle those. Are you getting the idea? Well, let's look at an acid anhydride. An acid anhydride is a non-metal oxide, a non-metallic oxide. A non-metal oxide acts like an acid. Therefore, a non-metal oxide plus a base should produce a salt in water. So if you take sulfur trioxide, that's the non-metallic oxide or the non-metal oxide of sulfuric acid. If you take that and put it with sodium hydroxide, you get sodium sulfate in water. If you take carbon dioxide and calcium hydroxide, what will you produce? It's like carbonic acid and calcium hydroxide. It'll produce calcium carbonate in water. If we take Cl2O3, do you remember that? Yeah. With potassium hydroxide, so Cl2O3 is the non-metallic oxide of chlorous acid. Put that with potassium hydroxide and you get KClO2, potassium chloride, and water. These gases such as sulfur trioxide, carbon dioxide, and the Cl2O3 are often gases. These gases are readily absorbed by these hydroxides. These hydroxides are often called scrubbers and are used in chimneys and so forth to remove gases that will react with them to produce these salts. Now let's look at the case in which a gas is formed. The gases that we're going to look at are carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen cyanide. Let's start with carbon dioxide. When you're talking about whether or not a reaction is going to be driven by the formation of carbon dioxide, you look for the formation of H2CO3. But instead of writing it as H2CO3, you write it as H2O plus CO2 gas. So if we have sodium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid, will we get a reaction? Well, if we double replace this now, if we put the sodium with the chloride and the hydrogen with the CO3, we could form sodium chloride and H2CO3. But remember, instead of H2CO3, write it as H2O plus CO2. And the gas is given off, and that drives the reaction forward. Zinc carbonate plus sulfuric acid. Swap the zinc and the hydrogen so that you get H2CO3 and you get zinc sulfate. So you're going to produce zinc sulfate and water and carbon dioxide. 
do you have the idea? A gas is formed. Now that's the carbon dioxide. Let's look now at sulfur dioxide. For sulfur dioxide, we look for the formation of sulfurous acid, H2SO3. But instead of writing it as H2SO3, we write it as H2O plus SO2 gas. So we have sodium sulfite plus hydrochloric acid. Swap the sodium and the hydrogen and produce sodium chloride and H2SO3, but don't write it as H2SO3 because, quite frankly, H2SO3 doesn't exist to a large extent in water. Instead, what it does is it gives off sulfur dioxide as a gas. Unless you put something in there to cap it, to hold that sulfur dioxide in there, it's going to come off as a gas, and that will drive the reaction forward. Along that same line, take barium sulfite and sulfuric acid and swap the barium and the hydrogen, produce barium sulfate, and you would have thought H2SO3, but you remember that it is written H2O and SO2 gas. Yeah. Now let's look for hydrogen cyanide. To look for hydrogen cyanide, what you want to think about is a cyanide salt like sodium cyanide or calcium cyanide or potassium cyanide and putting it with an acid. Here's sodium cyanide and hydrochloric acid. And when you have them together, you're going to produce sodium chloride and hydrogen cyanide, which will come off as a gas. Now, folks, this is the reaction that used to be used in the old gas chamber that was used to, to execute people. It's not used now, but in, I guess it is used wherever they still happen to use a gas chamber. If you take barium cyanide and sulfuric acid, you're going to produce barium sulfate and hydrogen cyanide gas. And it is, a, it is a lethal gas that is produced. And for this reason, you've got to be really careful in the lab with salts that are the cyanide salts. It's the sodium cyanides, the barium cyanides, and so forth. They are extremely dangerous. And you have to handle them with great care around acids. You should never rinse a cyanide salt down the drain if there's any acid around nearby at all unless it is done in an active hood. Now let's try these. What I would like for you to do is to pause the video and try doing each of these yourself. And then after you've tried them, bring the video back on again and let me show you how I did them. In this first one, we take sodium hydroxide and HClO3, chloric acid, an acid plus a base is going to give us the salt, sodium chlorate, and water. In this next one, we have zinc sulfate and barium chloride. Well, is a reaction going to occur only if something insoluble is formed? And in that case, it will form zinc chloride and a precipitate of barium sulfate. What about this next one, potassium cyanide and acetic acid? Well, this is a cyanide salt with an acid, and it will produce potassium acetate and hydrogen cyanide gas. The next one, the fourth one, is a reaction of an acid and a base, and it's going to leave us with barium sulfate and water. You need to balance these. What about calcium oxide and sulfuric acid? That is a metal, right, that's a basic anhydride, a metal oxide, and an acid, and that's going to produce a salt and water, calcium sulfate and water. Well, what about this last one, sodium chromate and potassium sulfate? And the answer is there's no reaction. Both of the reactants are soluble, and any products that might be formed now we're ready to talk about concentration of solutions. But let's do that in Lecture 2. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.
we're ready now to look at concentrations. And under concentrations, we're going to talk about percent as a way of expressing concentration, molarity as a way of expressing concentrations, and then we'll do a couple of assays. There are three common types of percent solutions. There is the mass-mass solution, in which everything is done by mass. There is the volume-volume solution, in which everything is done by volume. And there is the mass-volume solution that finds particular application in medicine and biology. Now, it's important to designate what type of solution you're using. But sometimes we don't do that. And if we do not specifically designate that it's M for M or V for V or M for V, then you should assume that it is a mass-mass solution. Because quite frankly, we get, we get kind of sloppy sometimes and don't designate that one because it's so commonly used. Let's start with the mass-mass solution. The easiest way to tell you about this is to give you an example. Suppose you have 100 grams of a 15% sugar and water solution. How much sugar do we have? Well, if it's a 15% sugar solution and the solution weighs 100 grams, then we take 15% of 100 grams and we say, okay, we've got 15 grams of sugar and we have also 85 grams of water. So we put 15 grams of sugar in 85 grams of water, stir it up, this gives us a 15% sugar solution because the whole thing weighs 100 grams. The question you might want to know is, what's the total volume? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know because I don't know the specific gravity of that solution or the density of the solution. But I can tell you everything about mass. Now remember, in this kind of a solution, mass is used for everything. Got the idea? In a volume-volume solution, everything is done by volume. Look, consider if we have 100 milliliters of a solution that is 15% V for V alcohol and water. Well, the alcohol is 15 milliliters, so we take 15 milliliters and we add water. How much water do we add? Whatever amount is needed to bring the volume up to 100 milliliters. Because it's 15 milliliters of alcohol in every 100 milliliters of solution. And quite frankly, you're going to ask the question, well, why isn't it 85 milliliters of water? And it may be, but it probably isn't. Why isn't it? When the solute and the solvent are in each other's presence, there is a relationship that is formed between them. That relationship can draw the molecules closer together, or quite frankly, it can push them apart. And which it does dictates whether the volume is going to be more than or less than the amount that we think. So what we do is we take 15 milliliters of the alcohol and we add enough water to bring the level up to 100 milliliters so that we have 15 milliliters of alcohol in every 100 milliliters of the solution. And remember, volume is used for everything. Now let's go to mass volume. Consider if we have 100 milliliters of a 15% mass volume glucose and water solution. And I'm using glucose because this is the one that is most frequently used in medicine and biology. And glucose and water is a common one. Well, how much glucose do we have? The amount of glucose that we have is 100 milliliters of the solution times 15 grams of glucose per 100 milliliters of solution. See, it's mass per volume. That tells us then that we have 15 grams of glucose. So we put in 15 grams of glucose. How much water do we add? It's kind of reminiscent of the one we were talking about a moment ago. 
we add enough water to bring the volume up to 100 milliliters so that it is in 100 milliliters of the solution we know we have 15 grams of glucose. Medicinally, we very often talk about 5% dextrose solutions or 5% glucose solutions. That's in every certain volume, 100 milliliters of the solution or 100 cc's, we have 5 grams of the glucose or dextrose. And as I told you earlier, this designation is frequently used in biology and in medicine. Let's look at molarity, and it's probably the most important method that we use when we talk about concentrations. Molarity, by definition, is moles of solute per liter of solution. Moles of solute per liter of solution. A shorthand way of noting it is molarity is moles per liter. Now, so how do we go about making these solutions? We take a device called a volumetric flask. Now, the volumetric flask I'm showing you is one that will hold a hundred, uh, I beg your pardon, a thousand milliliters at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, notice this line up here. That is called the fill line. And when you make a solution, you have to fill that volumetric flask so that the meniscus, the bottom of the meniscus, is exactly resting on that line. And that is the point at which you have a thousand milliliters in this one, or 250 milliliters in a 250 mil one, and so forth. Again, that's a volumetric flask. And it will be important for you to know when you get to the lab that these flasks are calibrated to contain. I'll explain that in a minute. Calculate the molarity made of a solution made by dissolving 5.4 grams of sodium chloride in 250 milliliters of solution. We're going to use a 250 milliliter volumetric flask. Well, we first take our 5.4 grams and convert it to moles. So we take our 5.4 grams and multiply it by one mole over 58.5 grams per mole. That's right. That tells us how many moles we have. And remember, molarity is moles per liter. So we now we're going to change to moles per liter. We've got moles. So we've got to get liters in the denominator. So it's times 1 over 0 0.250 liters. That's right, 1 over 250 liters. Our grams cancel, and we're left with moles per liter. And moles per liter is molarity. So the answer is 0 0.37 molar, or 0 0.37 moles per liter, or a molarity of 0.37. Got the idea? Let's calculate the molarity of a solution made by dissolving 10.3 grams sodium sulfate in 600 milliliters of solution. So we start with our 10.3 grams of sodium sulfate. And we know that one mole of sodium sulfate, when we add up the weights of the sodium sulfate, it's going to weigh 142 grams. Now be sure you see where that comes from. That gives us, when the grams cancel, that gives us moles of sodium sulfate times 1 over 0.6 liters. So that we're going to come out with 0 0.121 moles per liter, or molarity. Now, it's simple enough to do this. You take the grams, convert it to moles, and then find moles per liter, and that's your molarity. But what if we ask, what is the concentration of the sodium ion? Well, the concentration of the sodium ion is twice 0.121 molar. So the concentration of the sodium ion is 0.242 molar. Why? 
Well, you've got to know the formula of sodium sulfate. And the formula of sodium sulfate is Na2SO4. That's also how you need to put 142 grams when you add up two sodiums, one sulfur, and four oxygens. Folks, questions like this are designed not only to test your knowledge of the subject at hand, such as the molarity in this particular point, but also to test your knowledge that you have to have in order to be able to do the problem, which in this case would involve being able to go from the formula, from the name to the formula correctly with your knowledge of oxidation numbers. Let's go on. How many grams of sodium hydroxide are needed to make 400 milliliters of a 1.5 molar solution? Now, you want to stop, do this yourself, then come back and let me show you how to work it? Sure. Pause this and then we'll go on when you're ready. Now remember, molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. Therefore, when we do a little algebra, we find that moles is molarity times liters. Moles is 1.5 moles per liter times 0.400 liters. Liters are going to cancel, and that's going to leave us moles. So we have 0.6 moles, then, of the sodium hydroxide, but we need grams. So to find grams, we take our 0.6 moles times the molecular weight of sodium hydroxide, which is 40 grams per mole. Our moles are going to cancel, and this is going to give us 24 grams sodium hydroxide. It's really kind of straightforward, isn't it? And yes, you could have done it all in one line out there if you were comfortable doing it. There's certainly nothing wrong with doing it that way. Let's look at assays. You get in a shipment of hydrochloric acid, which indicates that it's 38% hydrochloric acid with a specific gravity of 1.19. And we want to know what is the molarity of the acid shipment. Well, this is 38% hydrochloric acid, and we did not designate if it was weight, weight, weight volume, or what. If a percent solution is not designated as to the type percent it is, remember, it is percent by mass. So we start out with a volume, and I'm going to start out with 1,000 milliliters because it's 1,000 milliliters per liter, and I'd like to get liters into my equation. So I take 1,000 milliliters per liter. The specific gravity is 1.19, so I know it's 1.19 times as dense as water. So the density is 1.19 grams per milliliter. Of this, it is 38% hydrochloric acid, so I multiply it by 0.38 to find the number of grams that I have of the HCl. And then I multiply that by the number of moles over 36.5 gram, which is the molecular weight of HCl. Now let's see what cancels. Milliliters cancel, grams cancel, and I'm left with moles per liter. You see the liters over there. and it's 12.4 molar. A case of sulfuric acid has an assay of 93.4% with a specific gravity of 1.84. Now we want to know what is the molarity of this solution. It is not at all unusual for cases of things like sulfuric acid to come in with this kind of information. And it is necessary very often for us to know or to confirm the molarity of the solution. Now molarity, as you know, is moles per liter. So I'm going to use a liter of this and figure out what the molarity is. A liter is 1,000 milliliters. So I use 1,000 milliliters per liter. I'm going to find the mass of this using the specific gravity, 
which of course tells me that the density is 1.84 grams per milliliter. And milliliters then will cancel. Now I have the mass of the solution. I need to find the mass of sulfuric acid. And it is 93.4% sulfuric acid. So I multiply it by 90 by 0.934. This is going to give me the mass of sulfuric acid which I can very readily convert to moles by one mole over 98 grams. Yes, and grams are going to cancel here and here, and it's going to leave me with an answer of 17.5 molar, or 17.5 moles Per liter. There you have it. Parts per million and parts per billion. Now we could also include parts per trillion and so forth, but it works as, it works very similarly. Let's look at a solution that is four parts per million sugar. What this is telling us is that in a million parts by weight, Four parts of that weight would be sugar. Now, it's very important for you to remember that these aqueous solutions are so dilute that that tiny little bit of sugar in that million parts by weight, frankly, does not impact the density to any significant extent. So the key to knowing how to work these is to remember you may use the density as being the density of water. And that certainly holds true for parts per billion in which the mass of solute is relative to a billion parts of solution, even more dilute. How many grams of lead must be dissolved, and we'd have to dissolve it in, in acid, but we're not going to worry about that right now, and diluted to a final volume of 100 milliliters to prepare a 10 parts per million solution. We want to make a solution that's 100 milliliters, and that solution is going to contain 10 parts per million lead. You may assume the solvent is water. We'd have to tell you otherwise. And you may assume then that the solution density is 1 because there's not enough lead in it to impact that density. So 100 milliliters times 1 gram per milliliter tells us we're working with 100 grams of solution. Now, we know that in this solution, we've got to have 10 grams of lead per million grams of solution. Where'd that come from? Yeah, that came up there in that 10 parts per million. But we don't want to deal with that much. We only want to deal with 100 grams. And when we work this out, it comes out to be 1 times 10 to the negative third grams of lead. Now, folks, you could do this by ratio and proportions. 10 grams of lead to a million grams of solution as X is to 100 grams of solution. You get the idea? It works the same way. Assume that drinking water is allowed to have as many as 5.2 parts per billion of nitrate ion. How many milligrams of nitrate ion is allowed in one glass, which is 90 milliliters of this tap water? Well, we start with our 90 milliliters of tap water, and we know that since it's one of these super dilute solutions, that we can use the density of water, and this gives us 90 grams of solution. We take 5.2 grams of nitrate, per 1 billion parts of water, or 1 billion parts of solution, rather, times 90 grams, and that's going to give us 4.7 times 10 to the negative 7 grams of nitrate. But we were asked how many milligrams. So we take our 4.7 times 10 to the negative 7 grams, and we know there are 10 to the third milligrams per gram. So that tells us then that we have 4.7 times 10 to the negative fourth milligrams of nitrate. Now, 
That said, let's make it more interesting. Yeah. Same problem with a small change. Assume the drinking water standard for nitrate ion is 5.2 parts per billion. How many milligrams of sodium nitrate would be allowed in one glass, 90 milliliters of tap water? Now we go through and we do the first part just like we did before. And in so doing, we come out that we need that we are allowed to have 4.7 times 10 to the negative fourth milligrams of nitrate ion per 90 milliliters of tap water. But let's find out how much sodium nitrate would be allowed in those circumstances. So we take our 4.7 times 10 to the negative fourth milligrams of nitrate ion and multiply that by 85 grams of sodium nitrate per 62 grams of nitrate ion. Got that by adding those atomic weights. And when we do, we come out with 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth milligrams of sodium nitrate that's allowed. Or you can do the same thing with a ratio and proportion. 4.7 times 10 to the negative fourth milligrams of nitrate is to 62 grams of nitrate ion as X is to 85 grams of sodium nitrate. There are any number of ways this can be set up, but this is one way to do this. Dilution of solutions. Now think for a moment. When you dilute a solution, what actually changes? Well, the volume and concentration both change. Okay, but this is important. What does not change? And the thing that doesn't change is the amount of stuff you've got in there, the amount of solute you've got in there. In other words, the moles of solute. Therefore, we can say that the moles of solute before we dilute is equal to the moles of solute after we dilute because it doesn't change. But moles is equal to molarity times liters. So molarity times liters before is going to equal to molarity times liters after dilution. Or if you will, molarity times milliliters is equal to molarity times milliliters. What volume of solution can be made by diluting 25 milliliters of 18 molar sulfuric acid to 3 molar. Well, molarity times milliliters is equal to molarity times milliliters. So filling it in and plugging it in and just going along, we have 18 molar times 2 point, I beg your pardon, times 25 milliliters is equal to 3 molar times an unknown quantity of milliliters that I'm choosing to call Y. And when we work this out, Y becomes equivalent to 150 milliliters of solution. Now, it's important that you remember that that is 150 milliliters of solution. All right, let's change it just a little bit. We have changed the problem to read what volume of water should be used to dilute the acid. Well, Working it is really looks kind of familiar. We start out and we calculate the volume of solution that we will produce. Now, knowing the volume of solution that we will produce, it seems kind of simple. Just take our 150 milliliters of solution and subtract 25 milliliters of the material we started out with, and that tells us, well, we should add 125 milliliters of water. But actually, it's not quite that simple. That 125 milliliters of water is only an approximation. Why? Well, remember an earlier discussion we had that we talked about how adding a solute and a solvent can cause different kinds of bonds to form. Molecules may move closer together. They may move further apart. It could require 125 milliliters of water, but probably not. It will probably require a little more or possibly a little less. But in any case, since we're adding 
sulfuric acid and water, you will remember to add the acid to the water. Well, this seems like a good place to stop for this, for this lecture, so we will continue our study of solutions by doing a problem to kind of remind us of everything at the beginning of the next lecture. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.